Bobby Fischer gets eliminated. Hey, chess fans, today we're going to take a step into our time machine and go back to October 16th, 1967 for the Seuss Interzonal. This chess prodigy, Bobby Fischer playing the white pieces versus Hungarian tactical expert, Laszlo Barkze playing the black pieces. We're in for an absolute treat in today's game. This was a qualifying event for the 1969 World Chess Championship. But Bobby Fischer gets eliminated from the event by the organizers. We're going to talk more about that after the game. So we have e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5. We quickly find ourselves in the midst of a Roy Lopez, which is a true test of strategic skill and one of Bobby Fischer's favorites. a6 was played by Barkse. And here you could capture on the knight, and Fischer has done that in, later in his career. In this game, he goes with the standard approach. Knight to f6, following the main line of the Roy Lopez, castle by white. And here you might be wondering, could you grab that pawn on e4? It looks like it's free. You can take the pawn on e4, but white will always win it back. Bishop e7, rook e1, b5, bishop b3, d6, c3. Now this is kind of the first strategic idea being shown by white. Usually in the Roy Lopez, you want to play for c3 and d4 as white with the pawns and you build this nice big pawn center. And if black ever captures on d4, you have the c pawn ready to capture back. And typically what black wants to do is move this knight off of c6 and play pawn to c5, and that's their way of fighting back for center control. We see castle by Bartze, pawn to h3. Now the main move here is knight to a5 followed by c5. But Bartze decides to play a knight to b8, and this is called the Briar Variation. Uh, the knight's going to come back out through d7, and it's the second most popular move to knight to a5. So, still pretty common. Pawn d4, knight b to d7, and now Fischer plays knight to h4. A slight inaccuracy according to the engine, but what he's doing is he's starting to put a little magic into the position. What he wants to do is take his knight, which is currently on the rim, and he wants to slide it in to this f5 square. And that knight has an outpost on f5. It's guarded by this pawn. It's not being attacked by anything else. And it's part of a bigger plan. So don't worry too much about the knights on the rim. Our dim quote here, Fisher has this plan. Knight to f5. And immediately, Bartze reacts incorrectly. And he plays e takes d4. But first, let me show you a better line for black. He could play rook to e8. And then after knight f5, meet it with bishop to f8. That would be a way to hold equality. And this is a common idea in the Roy Lopez, so I'm a little bit surprised that he didn't play it. But instead, he plays e takes d4, and just like we talked about, Fischer plays c takes d4 and gets this nice, big, uncontested center. Now, this can lead to tactical problems for Barce, because with these two pawns controlling all the space in the center, and no black pawns sitting on the fifth rank attacking them, these pawns are flexible for Fischer. And he can put his pieces behind the pawns and then launch the pawns forward at the correct moment to generate an attack. Now, at this point, the best move was played by black, knight to b6. But I want to look at a couple other options. First, let's look at knight takes e4. Because you might be wondering, couldn't black take the knight on h4 after the recapture on e4? But there's a strong in-between move, a really strong reply, knight to f5. And black cannot defend both this knight and the potential double attack on the bishop on e7. So for example, let's say black plays bishop to b7 and try to hold the knight. There's f3, the knight has to move, and then knight takes e7 check is coming, and white is winning. What if black goes for the immediate counter in the center with pawn to c5? This is one that I was wondering about, because that's the strategic theme for black here. That's how black usually fights back in the center in these positions. That runs into e5 with some sharp lines. d takes e, d takes e. This knight needs to move, or black needs to try c4, but this bishop is coming back to c2, hitting h7. And when the knight moves, that pawn becomes very tender, only defended by the king. This is a pretty large advantage for white as well. So, in the game, best move played, knight to b6. Now Fisher plays knight to f3 bringing that knight back to safety so that there's no threat a bishop takes. And really, he already got his goal. He got the big center. Now he can bring his knight back. So now Bartze punches in the center with pawn to d5, challenging the center, 
But really, Fisher's unfazed, and he's simply going to meet it with pawn to e5. And what Bartze should have done there is played pawn to c5, like we talked about. And after d5, go with this rook e8 plan. Much stronger pawn configuration for black. White only has a slight advantage, and black can play bishop to f8 next. So back to the game. d5, Fisher goes e5, knight e4, and now knight b to d2. Knight takes e4 is threatened, so Barksley decides, okay, I'm going to take that knight off first. Bishop takes, bishop f5. Now here, according to the engine, Fisher is already up plus 1.4. And there's two factors at play here. The first one is Fisher has a potential kingside attack where he can play pawn to e6 down the road. The second one is he has the rook coming to c1, which is a half-open file, applying pressure to that pawn on c7. Now, one thing that Bartse has in this position is he has the option of playing knight to c4, which is a good knight outpost. But engines doesn't, engine doesn't lie. Bishop f5 eval is plus 1.4 for white. Now bishop to c2 by Fisher, offering the trade of bishops. And this bishop for bishop trade is going to help remove one of the defenders for black of the king side. So that's a key point here. So bishop takes c2, queen takes c2, rook c8. Now pawn to b3 by Fisher, keeping the knight out of the outpost square, c4. And here, Bardsay makes a mistake and plays knight to d7. He shifts gears and tries to play pawn to c5 next. But what he should have done is he could immediately play c5. And after d takes c5, bishop takes c5, he does have an isolated pawn on d5. That's a potential weakness. But this is how modern chess players would probably play the position, modern grandmasters. They would fight very actively, and they wouldn't care as much about this strategic weakness. But instead, he goes knight to d7. This just feels a little bit passive. And now the spark that lights the fire on the board, pawn to e6. Here comes Bobby Fischer, U.S. chess champion at the time. Uh, f takes e6 was played, which is the top move. And if a move like knight to f6 is played, just to show you the amount of danger in the position for black, there's e takes f7 check, rook takes knight g5, attacking the rook. And if the rook moves, fork of queen and rook, that's going to be game over for black. So black had to be very careful here, and he decides to take the pawn. Correct decision. Rook takes e6, pawn to c5, another top move by Barksay. He's really playing some strong chess here for the most part trying to keep the game close to equal, fighting for dynamic chances. Can Bobby Fischer create anything out of this position? He finds a surprising move, bishop to a5. What a crazy idea. Attacking the queen, because the queen has a job to defend the bishop on e7, which is attacked by the rook. So the computer's not in love with this move. It's not one of the top moves, but it retains the advantage, and it puts a tough question to black. In human versus human games, you always want to pose your opponents with tough questions. Make them find difficult moves. So here Bartse plays queen takes a5, rook takes e7. Now the threat is rook takes d7, and there's only two good moves to keep black in the game, and white does still have the advantage. Those are c takes d4 and knight to f6. Those are the only two good moves, and Bartse makes a blunder with queen to d8. It looks completely logical, just bringing the queen back to defend the knight, but this is why you need to play for the initiative. Fischer had the initiative, Bartze had to react, and he made the wrong decision. He made the wrong choice. Now, if you want to pause the video, try to find Fischer's reply here. There's a very strong move. Bobby Fischer plays knight to g5, and Bartze tips his king. It's all over. He resigns the game in this position. It feels like an early resignation. But we're going to dive into this a little bit, and then we're going to talk about why Bobby Fischer got eliminated. So, knight to g5. There's really two moves for black. The threat is queen takes h7 checkmate, and black could either play pawn to g6 to block the queen, or knight to f6 to guard this h7 square. So, let's say knight to f6. If you want to pause the video again, try to find the top move for white. There's a nice tactical shot here. It's rook takes g7. And after king to h8, now there's rook takes h7 check, and the queen is coming into g6 if the king goes here, which is a mate, and if knight takes back, queen takes h7, also a mate. And then if we go back to the shot rook takes g7, 
If king takes e7, there's knight to e6 forking the king and the queen, and that's also game over for black. Now, what if Bartze plays g6 in this position? That's the other option. Well, with g6, there is still rook to g7 check with a similar idea to the other line, but white could also play queen to e2 or rook a to e1. Both of those moves are even stronger than rook to g7 check, and they give white a plus five advantage. And the lines are pretty deep, but essentially white has full control, and he's going to eventually infiltrate with all four of these attacking pieces. Okay, so what happened to Bobby Fischer in this event? It was a qualifier for the 1969 Candidates Tournament to give Fischer a chance to play in the World Championship if he were to win the Candidates. He was leading through 10 rounds. He had seven wins, three draws. And then he had a dispute with the organizers about the schedule. And from what I was reading, they were trying to accommodate Fischer's schedule, who didn't want to play at certain times due to religious reasons, but Fischer missed three games. And after that, he was booted from the event. The organizers decided he's out. And he had to wait three more years to do the next world championship cycle, which was not until 1972, which he did end up winning. So you could call it a world championship gambit. All right. Thanks for watching, guys. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.